my name is Yuina and welcome to Horizon West Church. We're so glad you're spending part of your weekend here with us. If you're new here, we want to invite you to stop by Connections in the back of the auditorium before you leave. We have a special gift from us to you to say thanks for coming. Here at Horizon West Church, we've discovered that most people are looking for two things. People want a sense of purpose and they want to feel like they belong. And our goal is to help you find that. We think that life is better connected. So no matter what phase of life you're in, you're welcome here. If you are a parent, we want you to know that the best experience we have for your kids from babies all the way up through fifth grade is over in Horizon West Kids. We've created an exciting experience just for them. It's fun and engaging and they can learn about God at their own level every week. It's never too late if you'd like to check it out. Our team is available right now to show you where it is, give you a tour, and help you and your child get connected. We believe that serving in the local church is one of the best ways to make a difference in our city. Our serve teams work together to create incredible environments and personal connections that help us share the gospel with everyone who comes in our doors. From the front door to the kids' experiences, there's a place for you. And to learn more about our serve teams, visit Connections or horizonwestchurch.com slash serve. Whether you're here for the first time or you've been around for a long time, we want to help you get connected to your best next step. If you have a question, want someone to pray with, or just information about something, stop by Connections before you leave today. We would love to meet you. In the next 60 minutes, we're going to sing some songs to a God who we love and who loves us. We'll have a time of giving as an act of worship and we'll hear an engaging and practical message that we can apply to our lives this week. With all that said, it's time to get started. Welcome to Horizon West Church. Well, one of the things that we're passionate about here and we're going to get the chance to do in just a minute um, is value our families. And something we're passionate about is, is um, reaching the next generation with the good news of Jesus. And one of the ways that we get to do that and we get to celebrate that and lift that up uh, here at Horizon West Church is through something we called child dedications. And real simply what this is, is just some families that are part of our community who have said, we want to come before uh, the church community this morning. We want to come before our church and we want uh, to ask our church to pray for our children as we raise them. And we want to commit to raising our children in a home where they're going to hear about the good news of Jesus. And so they're kind of walking up and making their way up right now. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy, who's our kids director, and she's just going to introduce them, share a little bit more about what this moment looks like uh, before we uh, enjoy it together. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Good. Well, this is one of my most exciting things to, that I get to do as being a kids director, and this is me getting to be able to partner with these families and you getting to be able to partner with these families and dedicating these sweet ones. Um, this is the parents that are coming be, uh, before the church and they are wanting to raise their kids um, to know Jesus in a godly household and we are there to support them and help them. So thank you so much for being here and parents, I'm so excited that you've taken this big step and um, will be dedicating your children to the Lord today. We have Zelda May Berthelot. Sydney Claire Williamson. <laughs> Isaiah Angel Urena. Mm. And Everett Miles Eck and Wyatt James Eck. Church family, what we want to do is just, uh, we're going to anoint these children. The anointing oil in scripture was always used to represent somebody that was being set apart for the purposes of God. And so it's completely appropriate as these parents bring their children that we're saying, Lord, we want these kids to be set apart for your purposes. We want to partner, as Mandy has already said, with these families and helping them to 
solidify the faith of their children as they grow and as they lay hold of Jesus for themselves. And so um, I'm going to anoint each of these babies with oil, and in just a moment, we're going to pray together as a church family. It washes off, I promise. <laughs> If you feel comfortable doing so, would you just extend a hand toward these children and toward their families, and I'll voice the prayer on our behalf. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for these families, God. We are grateful uh, for the way that they have chosen. God, I think about the verse in Joshua that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God, I pray that even as these families make that statement, that bold confession of faith, God, that their children would see God, that they would see an authentic faith in their parents, not a Sunday to Sunday faith, but a real faith that lives throughout the week, a faith that lives through hardship, a a faith that lives through difficulties and even through doubts and continues to persevere and look to you. And God, I pray that these children at the age where they're able to understand even the the basics of the gospel, that there is a God who sent his only son Jesus to die for them, to, to secure a place in heaven for them. God, I pray that these children would lay hold of that. God, I pray for these children what I pray for my own children, that they would have hearts that supernaturally gravitate to God, and Lord, that they would just live full lives of faith and faithfulness serving you. In Jesus' powerful name, we pray, amen. Would you help me again thank these families? Well, I want to first off just celebrate with you what God is doing at Horizon West Church. If you were able to be with us last week, you saw it firsthand. At our first birthday celebration service, we got to welcome 484 people to this campus to celebrate what God is doing, to look forward uh, to what he will do. We got to baptize individuals who were coming to say, Jesus is my Lord and I'm following him unashamedly. And today we will dedicate nine children to the Lord, five in this service already and four in the next. Praise God, what a great time to be part of what God is doing at Horizon West Church. Well, this week, uh, there was an event that took place that, at least in my recent memory, I can't, I can't remember a single event uh, that, was, that generated more buzz, I'll say it that way, that generated more buzz than this, this particular event. And as I was scrolling through Facebook one evening this week, it, it was something like seven or eight consecutive posts were dealing with this one event that took place this week. It was not generated by a politician, not generated by a corporation, uh, not generated by a celebrity, and yet it captured the imagination of our entire nation. Over the last several years, generations, but especially these last several years, we have been having important conversations as a nation, conversations about prejudice and power dynamics, the relationship between white Americans and black Americans, between civilians and law enforcement officers, between men and women. And these conversations are incredibly important. But this week, someone spoke into the conversation, or rather gave us a demonstration of the power of the gospel. For those who may not be aware of the situation, last year a female police officer, Amber Geiger, entering the wrong apartment at the end of a shift, shot and killed a young black man. Tuesday, a Dallas jury found her guilty of murder. And the conversation has begun to be generated of, was the sentence enough? Do we really value the lives of all people, including black lives? And again, these are important conversations, and these conversations should not go away. And yet, in the midst of it, this demonstration of the gospel... I think somewhat changed the conversation. I want to show you a video in case you haven't seen it. It's about two and a half or three minutes long. And then I want to offer some comments and then we'll launch into the message this morning. Watch the screens. Um, This is the picture of what Dr. King and the leaders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference told us was possible. When people who have every right to demand justice, to to hold the offense that was rightly done or rather wrongly done to them, and yet on an individual level say, I choose to forgive, I choose to give grace. 
And what you may not have seen was after this, the judge, a black woman, came off of her stand and handed Amber Geiger a Bible. Forgiveness of sin and a way forward. That, that's the gospel. See, that's the gospel, and that's the opportunity. But, but here's the thing about forgiveness, and this is where we'll get into the text that we have this morning. Forgiveness can be a really, really, really hard thing to give someone. And it can be a really, really, really hard thing to receive as well. I want to catch you up on the story of King David. If you were here two weeks ago, you saw us look at a man who was called by God to lead the nation of Israel. He was called, in fact, a man after God's own heart. And yet, after committing adultery and murder and experiencing months, if not perhaps years of unrepentant sin, David is confronted by the prophet Nathan. He is brought face to face with the wrong that he has done. And in that message two weeks ago, we looked at four principles for confronting sin. This week, we're going to finish the story. And we're going to look at David's response. And from that, we're going to see four steps toward redeeming the regrets in our lives. And as I said then, I'll say it again now, I believe the story we're going to look at, the text we're going to read this morning, represents the single most critical moment in the life of David. Now you might go, well, wouldn't the most important moment in David's life be the time when Samuel came to anoint him to be the next king? Well, yeah, that was pretty important. Or what about when David stepped onto a battlefield with a sling and a stone and killed the giant? That, that was important. And yet I firmly believe that this the verses we're about to read represent the most important moment in the life of David. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 to 15. If you've got a Bible, you can go there. It'll also be on the screens. I want to read for you David's response after Nathan has confronted him with his sin. Verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You will not die. Nevertheless, because... Uh, you did this deed because by this deed you've utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you will die. And then Nathan went to his house. Most important moment in David's life give us the six most important words David ever spoke. I have sinned against the Lord. Now I want you to think about this in the context. You, you would think that David would be more guilt stricken by his sin horizontally. Right? Like, his sin cost a man Uriah not only his wife and his family, but ultimately his life when David had him killed. His sin cost Bathsheba, who, who listen, when you're the king, you get to get what you want, right? His demand. I, I don't blame Bathsheba. She's not the guilty party here. David has used his power, his position. He's coerced. He's manipulated. So he has sinned against multiple people. He sinned against the army when he sent them to fight his battle so that he could stay back and indulge his flesh. David has sinned in massive ways against people. And yet his response is, I've sinned against the Lord. Now I was thinking through this and going, man, what, what caused David to recognize more even than his sin against people that his sin was against God? And, and if we were to flip back earlier to where Nathan is confronting David, listen to the words that Nathan brings from God to David. God to David says this, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, and if this were too little, I would have given you much more. God seems to be saying to David, I, I put you in this position. I gave you this trust, and you've abused it. Never forget when I was in college, um, I, I was on a freshman dorm, and some of us had vehicles and some of us didn't, and there was this one guy in our dorm, and there's always one, like in every friend group, in every hall, every situation, there's always this one guy. Um, his name happened to be Patrick. If your name is Patrick this morning, this is not, you know, no offense to you. We've actually got some good Patricks here, but this kid Patrick, we're freshmen in college, and, and he says, hey Chris, can I, uh, can I borrow your car? I'm like, yeah, sure man. So he takes his car. Well, I find out later that he and some buddies of mine in my vehicle went through a McDonald's drive-thru, ordered nothing but a water, and then dumped it on the girl that handed it to him. This girl making minimum wage, trying to do her job. These guys from a Christian college thought it would be funny to do that. And I was furious. Like, I wasn't even there, but I'm like, dude, that's my car, right? That was also a movie. I didn't mean to do that. But, but dude, like, 
Like, you, you took something I gave you. I, I, you wouldn't even been in the position if I didn't put you behind the wheel. That reflects on me. That, that ref- and, and that's just a jerk thing to do. And so there was this anger aroused within me. Now, it was a sin against the girl, but it was also a sin against me. They abused the privilege that I had given them. In fact, David was so convinced of God's holiness and his righteousness that whatever the impact of his sin was on other people, David felt it as if it was against God alone. In fact, Psalm 51.4 says those very words. He says, Lord, against you only have I sinned. Now, is it true that David only sinned against God? No. But comparatively, when we understand the righteousness and the holiness of God, man, our sin, it's first and foremost against him. There is no such thing as a victimless sin. That, that sin that you covet, that you cherish, that you keep in private, that you think, oh, this isn't really harming anyone. Yes, it is. It's harming you, and it's defying a holy God. And David recognized that. His immediate posture is one of brokenness. Let me ask you a question for those of you who might be leaders. And, and what I want to do in the remainder of our message this morning is, is give you four steps toward redeeming regrets. Four steps toward redeeming regrets. The first step is going to be this. Allow the voice of correction. Allow the voice of correction. If, if you consider yourself a leader, and all of you should consider yourselves leaders because you have influence, right? And if you are an influencer, if you have influence in your home or your workplace or any such situation, I want to ask you the question, how much disagreement do you allow in your life? How much disagreement? How much voice of dissent do you allow to be around you? In your business, on your team, in your home, among your friends? Pastor Andy Stanley said this, Leaders who refuse to listen will soon be surrounded by people who have nothing significant to say. Right? And if you create a wall around you, an impenetrable wall where nobody can, nobody can speak the truth to you, you know, the emperor has no clothes, but you're not going to allow anyone to tell you that. What you'll find is you got a bunch of sheep around you who are just going along with whatever you say, a bunch of yes men, yes women, and pretty soon you'll find yourself in a bad place because you've not allowed a voice of correction. Husbands, we've got to allow the voice of correction in our home. I, I, I got to tell you, some of the most stinging things that I've heard in my life were from my wife because they were true, <laughs> Right? Now remember, Nathan doesn't come with a sledgehammer, he comes with tact and wisdom and even some grace in the way that he approaches the situation, but he brings the voice of correction and David is shattered underneath it. We have to allow the voice of correction in our life. A couple of weeks ago in our small group, uh, we were discussing this with some of the other uh, couples in the group and the question came up, what do you think Nathan was feeling, this prophet who was approaching the king? Uh, and confronting him on his sin. Now, we know situations in the Bible where that didn't go real well. Remember John the Baptist? He pulls Herod aside. Hey, Herod, this sin that you did, uh, God isn't okay with that. And Herod's like, okay, you're going to go to prison, and then you're going to get your head cut cut off. Like, that's what's going to happen. That's what David could have done. Nathan knew that. Nathan knew he's kind of walking on eggshells here. He's got to tread lightly. He's coming before the most powerful man in the world and calling him out. But here's my hunch. I think Nathan knew David. I think he knew David well enough to know that David was, in fact, a man after God's heart. And even though he had sinned so egregiously, if Nathan could just show him how wrong it was, if he could just bring the voice of correction, bring the word of the Lord to him, that that more than likely this man after God's heart who had sinned would respond. See, I think Nathan knew the heart of David. And this is so different than the king that came before David. If you don't know the history, a real brief history is that God set aside a people for himself called Israel. He said, I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be your leader. I'm going to be your God. You don't need anything else. And the people said, actually, we want what everybody around us has. By the way, when a culture starts saying that, when a Christian culture starts saying that, it gets kind of dangerous, right? I I want to look like everyone else. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. God says, well, then I'll give you a king. A man named Saul was raised up, and Saul was not a man after God's heart. And for that reason, God chose someone else, the man David. But what's striking to me is is that Saul's sin against God really doesn't, in my mind, rise to the level of what David did. 
Like, I can't think of a time, it doesn't record in Scripture, that, that Saul took another man's wife as his own. I, I can't find a time where Saul unjustly had a friend, someone loyal to him, killed. Like, Saul didn't do those things. Saul's sins, relative, relatively speaking, might not have been as big as David's. But you know what Saul did when the prophet Samuel confronted him? He made excuses. He blamed the situation. He justified his actions. See, w- one of the biggest determiners of a person who's a person after God, God's heart and a person who's not is not that the one doesn't fail and the other does. Both fail. We all fail in many ways. But people who are after the heart of God, when they're confronted with their sin, they own it. They take responsibility for it. And, and this is exactly what David does. And so even though David is going to have some really dire circumstances, and yes, circumstances are part of the deal. Uh, you know, w- when we put ourselves in a situation, there are consequences to our actions. But God would not take the throne away from David because he demonstrated his heart in the way he responded to the voice of correction. Second step, acknowledge your sin. It does not get clearer than what David says in 2 Samuel 21, 13. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. In fact, Psalm 51, he says, I've been brought forth in iniquity. He says in in verse 3 of the same chapter, my sin is always before me. David didn't say, okay, I made a mistake, right? Okay, yeah, I, I messed up. It was a bad judgment call. I'm not proud of it. David said it's sin. It's sin. That's that's, that's what it is. I, I knew what I was doing, and I chose to do it. I have sinned against the Lord. But then he confesses it. He confesses it. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Now something happened about 500 years ago in the Reformation. And, and listen, the Protestant Reformation was a very important thing that, that brought a lot of good things with it. But there were some things that weren't so good that got snuck in as well. And one of the things that we lost as a church is the power of confession. Luther and the others rightly recognized that we don't need a priest to go to God. We can go to God directly, right? And that's true. The problem is, in practice, we got so used to just confessing our sin to God and never speaking it to other people that we lost the power of confession. See, it's not about forgiveness. You are forgiven, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You're forgiven because a man named Jesus hung on a cross and bled and died for you. What you need is healing. And healing comes through confession. I'll never forget about seven years ago, leaving a Saturday night service at our John Young campus. And there was some sin in my heart. And it had not yet been full grown. The Bible tells us that sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. But I'm telling you guys, God showed me, he said, Chris, if you continue on this path, it's going to cost you more than you want to pay. And I, and I, had, said, I had said to God, God, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to keep doing this, but it, it wasn't changing the situation. And I think the Lord just put it on my heart, and I called my buddy Steve in Indiana. I said, Steve, I just got to tell one person something. <laughs> he says, go ahead, man. And I began to confess just some of the stuff that was in my heart, some of the things that had been going on in my life. And through the power of confession, I began to receive healing. Someone said, we're only as sick as our secrets, and that's true. Right? When the scripture tells us to walk in the light as he is in the light, what it's not saying is be perfect. What it's saying is live a transparent life. Live in such a way that there is at least somebody who knows everything. And I also think that everyone should know something. That's why I'm kind of transparent. I don't want anybody thinking that their pastor is somehow superhuman or, 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 you know, better than others. Now, I have a high responsibility, and I take that very seriously. I think God holds me to a high standard as the shepherd of the flock of God. But listen, I'm a broken person, just like every one of us. And i got to have some people that know what that brokenness looks like. David confessed his sin, and it was the beginning of redeeming his regrets. The third step David takes is to go to God, to go to God. Psalm chapter 51, I'm not going to take time to read it, but I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Read Psalm chapter 51 later today. Psalm is the very middle of your Bible, and chapter 51 is about a third of the way in. 
And if you're very familiar with the passage and with the story of David, maybe read it in a different version or, or a different rendition of Scripture. Maybe the message version would be a great way to read how David responds after Nathan has come to him in Psalm chapter 51. But what David does is he goes to God. And here is the great paradox. We are never more reluctant to go to God than when we've sinned, right? This is the, the curse of the garden, Adam and Eve. Uh-oh, we've sinned. We better hide. We better hide behind this tree. Or maybe take some fig leaves and cover up our nakedness. Sin makes us want to hide from God. But we are never more in need of God than when we sin. And so at the very time where we should be running to God, where we should be going in the direction of God, we have this tendency to withdraw and draw back. And the gospel says, come. There's a a meme that's been going around that says, religion says I've messed up. Daddy's going to kill me. The gospel says, I've messed up. I need to call my dad. Right? Don't you love that? Isn't that such a a, a paradox, a a juxtaposition? Remember the the prodigal son? He's in the middle of his filth. He's wandered to a distant country. He's squandered his wealth. He's living among pigs. He's starving to death. And he goes, man, maybe if I go home to my dad, I can at least get a seat at the table. Or, Or if not a seat at the table, maybe just a place to lay my head as one of his servants. And by the time he's most of the way home and within the eye shot, his father is running toward him. Go to God. When you've sinned, that that, that instinct to withdraw or to kind of like punish yourself, like, oh man, I can't can't pray or read my Bible because that's hypocritical. No, 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 like press into God in that moment. Go to his grace. Receive mercy from him. In the language of Psalm chapter 51, which you're going to read later, 20 times David asks God to act on his behalf because David knew an important truth. It is only after we position ourselves to receive from God that we are ready to act for God. See, again, religion reverses that. Act, 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 and eventually you get to receive from God. The gospel says receive from God. Just receive by grace through faith. And from that place, we get to act And do the things that God has called us to do. Here's the fourth and final step to redeeming our regrets. Look ahead. Look ahead. Psalm chapter 51 verse 13. David says three important words. He says, then I will. David had this moment of transition from looking at the sin that he had committed to looking forward to what God had for him next. And he says two things. I will worship God and I will teach other people. You go, hold on, time out. Doesn't moral failure disqualify us from ministry? Well, apparently not, right? David said, well, now, now that I'm laying down this sin, now that I'm confessing this, I've, I've gone to God, I've, I've owned it, now I'm looking ahead, and I know on the other side of this brokenness, there is going to be redemption, and there is going to be a ministry for me. In fact, I believe that life's greatest lessons sometimes are learned through failure which means that some of life's greatest teachers are people who have failed in big ways. Failure does not disqualify you. A refusal to acknowledge your guilt and your sin and to go to God in reconciliation, that may. And and yes, it may need some time, and, and it may need some process behind it. But God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He doesn't give and take away. And say, oh, well, now you've screwed up. I'm just going to put you on the shelf. You're done. In fact, one of my heroes, a man named Nate Larkin, has an I Am Second video. And I love what Nate says in the video. Nate was a man who had been thoroughly caught up in sexual addiction. Thoroughly. For years and years and years. Oh, and by the way, he was a pastor. And on this I Am Second video, Nate shares his story. And he says something so profound. He says, I thought the day that my secret came out, my ministry would end. It turns out, that's the day it began. God isn't done with you. And if we will look ahead in faith, we will see a future in which God is redeeming the very sins and regrets that have held us captive. And is using us to bring his redeeming power into the lives of others. So keep going. Keep looking ahead. Have you ever noticed that your rearview mirror is significantly smaller than your windshield? Because apparently we're supposed to spend more time looking forward than looking back. So look ahead. 
Look forward to what God has in store for you. I can tell you that I would not be the pastor I am today if I hadn't gone through some stuff and had to own it and bring it into light and say, this is my story. And sometimes sitting across the table from somebody as I tell my story, they go, you know what? My story is kind of like that. And we begin to redeem our regrets and our sins together. I want to close by reading one verse out of Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51 verse 17. I've shared four steps with you, but there's one secret that if you miss it, the steps aren't going to work. It's not going to matter. Psalm 51 and verse 17. This is what it says. The sacrifices of God, David says, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The secret is one word two times in that verse. The word is broken. Broken. See, brokenness is kind of our problem, right? We're broken people. It doesn't work the way it should. We say the wrong thing. We get around the wrong people. We, we hurt the ones we love. We're broken. Brokenness is the problem, but here's the good news. Brokenness is the solution. The Hebrew word that David uses here is the word for shatter. And here's what I found to be true in my life and in the lives of so many others. 1,000 broken and shattered pieces in the hands of our creator, way better than us just gutting it out and staying strong in our own strength. So if you're broken this morning, just bring your brokenness to the Lord. That's what he desires. It's not trying harder. It's not singing louder. It's not getting up earlier to do the things to have. It's just a receiving. It's just a giving of ourselves to the Lord and saying, God, I'm broken, but I have a suspicion. I have a hunch that you're the God of broken people and that what is ahead of me can be greater, fuller, and more beautiful than anything that is behind me. We're going to sing together a song that we introduced earlier. The song is called Waymaker. I want to invite you just where you're at to stand. I also want to do something we don't take the time to do every week, but I'm going to ask you for just a second before we sing to close your eyes. Because some of you possibly in this room, you're going, man, Chris, I don't, like, were you watching me this week? Or, man, what, this seems to have been God speaking to me. Like, like God sent Samuel to Saul or, or Nathan to David. I feel the burden that you're talking about. And everybody's going to have their eyes closed for just a minute so you can have an opportunity. If that's you, you say, Chris, I, I feel shattered today. I feel broken today. And I need the healer. Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Nobody else is looking around but me. I see several hands going up. Keep them up for just a second. I want to pray for you. Anybody else that, that just goes, I need my shattered pieces put back together today. We are clay in the hands of a potter who is gracious, who is good, and who loves us. Can I pray for you? Father in heaven, as you see these hands raised, as they continue to remain raised, God, as you see these hands up, these are hands that are in the posture of reaching for you, God, not because we could reach you, but because you reach down to us. And through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, we learn this incredible truth, what our, our first church people, the, the first century believers called the good news. That there is a God who can take broken pieces and make them beautiful again. You are the way maker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. God, we are looking to you. Would you redeem and restore? In Jesus' name we pray.